Okay, um, just a f few words of, uh, of introduction. Um, welcome everybody on this beautiful day. Uh, first lecture of the season. Um, everybody's just uh, on the edge. Um, it's, uh, students have just had the first date with their teacher, right? Mm -hmm. So it's like uh, complicated. Uh, <laughs> it should be the beginning of an adventure, uh, but it's really like the first episode of a reality show, <laughs> right? With all of that complication. So if you see that kind of strange look in the audience, it's that sort of post-date, uh, post-first date feeling. Um, also, first date here for you, right? Yeah. Uh, and I hope you will come back. Hope that we will be nice for you. Um, Julian, it's an uh, office, JDS uh, uh, Architects is an office based in uh, Copenhagen since uh, 2006. You have maybe four other partners, is that right? Or yeah. four partners, so five, team of five. Before that was Plot with uh, Bjarke Engels, which was exactly five year experiment starting in 2001. Before that, OMA uh, Rotterdam uh, for just a little bit, a little bit of time. Before that was finishing the last of six schools. Bartlett, I think, was the one that killed you off. <laughs> I mean, you could argue that if you do six schools of architecture and one of them actually you graduate, um, <laughs> there's something wrong with that school, right? So <laughs> somehow that school tricked you into becoming a regular student and getting a degree, so that was the Bartlett. But before that was also already at OMA, so at, at OMA Rotterdam, as, again as a student. So some kind of uh, uh, illegitimate transfer backwards and forwards between school and uh, uh, an office. And the moment you're actually out of school, you get out of the office like really fast and set up your own office. And it goes like this. So it's a kind of nomadic uh, story. So before that first stint at OMA is about another five schools, which gets us back to Brussels. And before that, I think you were born in Brussels, yep. right? So sort of a super Brussels, but operating in Copenhagen, and I think what's of course great is is that y y your office and you yourself have been embarrassingly successful, mm. and so there is the, there's this kind of phenomenon uh, of that moment in time, uh, even it becomes somehow almost a kind of Scandinavian phenomenon, uh, or at least this this uh, uh, part of Europe in which a series of architects are, are asked and can deliver uh, architecture which has a certain um, uh, a very sharp, clear uh, edge to it. Uh, and, it's t and it seems to me what's, what's kind of uh, uh, common about this work is uh, that there's never anything the same. It's like really relentlessly every time different. So it's a kind of requires an almost military capacity to generate for each different job a completely different uh, 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 concept, but also for that concept to be in a way super sharply uh, uh, defined so that in a, in a certain sense the uh, project speaks for itself. Right? That's the theory of it. Uh, this goes everywhere from kind of lampposts to staircases to cities. So if you are used to thinking of objects like furniture having, having, to, having, a, having a kind of self-branding uh, capacity, uh, in, in, in the, in, with this generation of architects, that's also true of cities uh, and everything in between. So I think it's a sort of a super uh, interesting phenomenon, which you know, of course, because of the exhibitions, because of the books, because of the videos, because of the blogs, and so on. So the last thing you need is actually to listen to the architect. Right? because this work is speaking for itself and also it's speaking through multiple medium, but we did the old-fashioned thing to invite the architect to come and talk to you. Julian, great that you're here. Thanks. <clears throat> Can you get the lights off? Um, okay. So, <laughs> thanks, Mark, uh, for this intro and for inviting, of course. Thanks, Ben, for uh, dealing with all my uh, little issues uh, to get here, uh, and Lucia as well. So uh, I'm gonna show, uh, first I'm just gonna show the office because I, I, I kinda like my office and uh, <laughs> I like uh, the people in it. And I like this, uh, this aspect of the office which is very much you know, uh, compliant to my own sort of past as Mark described, which is this sort of a, a kind of multifaceted uh, international uh, location where you can see a lot of <coughs> young people obviously 
some older ones, but I'm not claiming to employ Cecil Bauman. He's working with us on some projects. Um, this is our new office in Brussels, rather empty still. <coughs> this is a happy French guy delivering a project. Uh, <laughs> you can see some New Yorkers in the background. Um, another thing that's obvious is that because we work in these sort of multi uh, national kind of conditions. We are also working, you know, using sort of uh, the, the kind of basic medias of today. Uh, and this is a meeting we had with uh, Michael Speaks, uh, who I was uh, uh, teaching for in uh, Kentucky, but also uh, was working with on our book agenda uh, this past year. This is uh, just a normal day at the office where Italians uh, rest. <laughs> 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 and so that, that's kind of the image of, the, of our uh, practice, in, in a way, the flag of it, uh, which should be flickering and you know, changing because, of course, being a young office, we have a lot of incoming and uh, you know, outgoing. Uh, and this is an image of the places where we've been working and where we've been sort of developing projects, sometimes uh, uh, failures, sometimes successes. I'm just going to show some of the successes quickly without going into details. A psychiatric hospital in a in uh, close to Copenhagen in Edzinger. A project that's called the VM Houses. I'm not gonna go into details because I'm sure you know all these projects. Uh, so I'm just gonna aspect, uh, show one aspect of each. Uh, for this one, the fact that we developed these sort of weird balconies that were meant to actually activate you know, a potential uh, uh, vertical park. Uh, and what came out of it was this uh, weird condition of uh, overpopulation of barbecues uh, onto the <laughs> balconies, <coughs> meaning that it is active in, in a sense. Um, it's a sort of crazy view from a photographer. The M house, and then the mountain. The mountain is a very special project that, you know, all these projects were developed as plot. Uh, and the, what's special about this one, what I think is particularly special is this sort of void in between, you know, the housing and the parking. Um, why, why I think this is special is because that's the place where actually a, a performative take is happening or this, the, the sort of performance of the unknown is happening where you have basically this kind of staircase that kind of takes you up and is publicly accessible and takes you all around the building, you know, all the way to the peak up there, which is also the Mount Everest uh, picture you might, you might have heard. Another thing that was interesting about this building is that in uh, sort of party organizers starting, started taking it over and taking it into a, a sort of a playground for their own uh, happenings. So there was this distortion festival, electronic music festival happening in the, in the mountain, which was a pretty uh, sort of <coughs> unexpected event for us when they asked us to, uh, to do this, um, this happening. Uh, also under the rain, I don't know why this guy has <laughs> an umbrella because it's actually covered. Um, so I'm going to go through a series of like three typologies of performative architecture. One is, is performative installation and starting actually with two projects in uh, New York. One in 2006 that uh, we did in uh, Artist Space. So I guess most of you know the, the small gallery. We were given a tiny space inside the gallery to, uh, to sort of do whatever we wanted. <coughs> and the idea was instead of like showing, you know, an actual series of uh, project or installations or sort of a, a how do you call it uh, models of our work we decided to actually make um, a sort of an exploration of on space like trying to uh, let people discover space and maybe that kind of compression and extension of space so the way we did it is actually to set up a, a program that allows to perceive the entire New York City block through this uh, through this uh, visual uh, installation, which I'm going to show. Hopefully it's going to work. So what you have here, or what you should have, let me see. Yes. So I'm just going to explain. This is the space, this tiny space is in fact the half uh, space of the existing uh, gallery. So what we did is we built this wall and then we made a retro projection over onto it. And we have, as you can see up there, a little camera that's a, a, a sensor. And it senses the location of the guy, uh, of the person in the space. You can be multiple people in the space. And the point of it is that as the person walks towards the screen, he will actually walk towards 
the entire New York City block all the way to the uh, street behind. Um, and so it looks a little bit like this. The first space that he will encounter is actually the storage space of an um, artist space. So it's a rather messy uh, space. We had to kind of record you know, visually the whole uh, uh, series of spaces behind. As he goes through this, he will have a sort of a, um, a studio, an artist studio that goes then into a, 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 an apartment of the artist. And beyond that, there's a, a sort of rooftop and then you can see the other side of the street. So this is what, like one sort of compressed series of spaces uh, put together into you know, a sort of a experience that makes you go beyond the space that you're uh, within. And th this came up as a kind of idea to actually explore you know, the condition of space or the perception of space itself, which is something that we don't get to do much uh, uh, in architecture when we deal with you know, uh, build projects like we do. Um, another installation was one that we did for uh, the uh, Contemplating the Void exhibition uh, for, um, for Guggenheim, where we decided to, uh, if I just show the space, to make an installation that would allow for people as, you know, the idea of the, the sort of museum is to go down so from, uh, from the top level all the way to the, to the ground floor. The idea here would be to go down, but not within the exhibition spaces, but in fact within the void itself. And that's why we called it the Experiencing the Void uh, installation. And it's this sort of bouncing net that uh, uh, spirals down all the way to the, to the ground floor. And so this, this is, of course, not, not done as a project, <coughs> but it's, a, it's, a, it's an idea. Which brings me to a, a person that I respect a lot is a, a skater. I was myself a skater for years and I sort of uh, uh, like in particular this guy's work. <laughs> I call it work, but most people would call it uh, destruction, uh, which is a, a sort of form of street skating that's extremely advanced. I'm just gonna show a video of what he does. And so obviously, you know, skating in the street is all about sort of, you know, destroying or abusing uh, the streetscape. One thing that's interesting about the way he does it is just like, he's also sort of manipulating the tool itself that he's using, which is a uh, skate uh, board. He invented this uh, way of sliding where he slides on the grip like this, uh, which was, you know, totally a, a total revolution when he came out, uh, at least for us skaters. And um, I just think like his type of intervention in space is really uh, uh, the sort of thing that we would like to contribute to with our work. So let's see if we manage. Uh, these are some of the projects that I would uh, classify in different ways. This is uh, like two or three projects that I call program landscapes are in fact spaces, mostly public spaces that we have injected uh, with some programs such as this uh, youth house in Copenhagen. It's a sailing club and a youth house, so it's devoted to you know, uh, young kids. Uh, and what was interesting about it is that not only uh, the project provided you know, the spaces and the kind of community spaces that were required, but also it provided this kind of somehow like the topography of spaces that were not sort of so required, but uh, unleash a kind of attitude towards uh, using the, the facilities. This is actually a day where we went to shoot where the kids decided to um, uh, form two sort of uh, rival teams because there's two hills and they were trying to kind of, uh, you know, get the hill of the opponent. And, and so they started like sort of playing with these uh, uh, virtual fake guns with hockey sticks, uh, trying to, uh, I mean, basically doing what kids do. But in this environment being like a quiet, exciting uh, uh, setting for, uh, for a photo shoot. Another project that we uh, accomplished in uh, the early years, 2003 here for this um, harbor bath in uh, Copenhagen, was the idea to actually just provide, you know, a space for, uh, for uh, outdoor bathing and, and sort of outdoor public uh, uh, use on the water itself, plugging it onto uh, the existing park. So it just came up to be this sort of very uh, busy place. Um, 
if you're not so busy on this picture, but normally on some days you have like, uh, you know, you can't even lay a towel on this, uh, on this uh, park. And uh, later on we were asked, uh, we participated in a competition to do a, a huge uh, public space on the other side because the other side, the side of the harbor is completely depraved of activities. There's hardly anything uh, happening. Uh, maybe thanks to some of these like really ugly and big buildings uh, uh, that are not doing anything for the public space. Um, so the idea there was to actually create a sort of extension of, of the piers. Um, this is the way it looks today, which is pretty deadly and to uh, extend the piers onto the waterfront again, uh, by doing that, creating a sort of a series of new connections, a new promenade, and then like, uh, trying to kind of place these different locations, these different uh, 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 squares, in a way that would allow for a uh, sun to, uh, to, uh, to be optimized, giving a few spaces for actual water activities, so it's not a a swimming pool as such, but it is a, a canoe and kayaking uh, uh, park. And so ending up with this scheme that, where you can see one, one particular aspect is that it actually reconnects to the harbor bath. Unfortunately, that's an aspect that we're uh, fighting for still, uh, the, the reconnection to the harbor bath. And the reason why I think it's really an important one is because it sort of, uh, it, 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 may, it gives an understanding of the, the city as a whole instead of being like, you know, the one side against the other side, it's very much about saying, okay, if there's st stuff happening on one side, we can use it and drag it over onto the other side. So that's the scheme as it should be developed. Uh, we're gonna start construction in September, uh, sorry, uh, January, so first uh, month of uh, next year. Uh, we just get prizes back from the uh, construction companies and it's okay, so. I think we can, uh, we can attack. Uh, there's a series of programs within the project that are uh, added that are not you know, purely public spaces such as shops. Uh, there's the, the canoe uh, uh, sort of club. And as I explained, this connection back onto the, the land of the, the harbor bath. Uh, which brings me to a, a, a sort of similar project in many ways in Italy, <coughs> in the city of Rimini. I'm just showing this uh, uh, ridiculous uh, picture because uh, I had to present that project uh, the day after the Dutch and the Italian team had a game and the uh, Italian uh, lost. And because of my name, it, <coughs> it felt like a, a bit of an issue. The Smet is also like a, a Dutch name. So uh, <coughs> I, I, I was fearing a lot of uh, sort of negative responses, both from the mayor's side, but also from the citizens. Uh, and then on top of that, there was this other historical moment, because uh, I cannot hide my you know, French accent. And uh, uh, because I'm also half French, so uh, there's this like other uh, situation. And so I basically showed this picture to these people, and sort of explaining that this was not so much about, you know, who I was or where I was coming from, but much more about their own issues. Um, and the city of Rimini is an interesting place because historically in Europe it was like one of the first sort of beach party places, you know, before Ibiza and stuff. And um, now it's sort of it's dying out as a, as, a, as a buzzing place and it's more becoming a, a, a kind of family uh, sort of uh, uh, holiday place. And the mayor of course wants to turn it into this kind of cultural uh, hub for uh, high culture. So the site of the competition is a private, partner, uh, private public partnership uh, uh, competition. This is, I think it's 1.6 uh, kilometer long uh, stretch. And uh, with our sole competitor is uh, Jean Nouvel, and I'm still uh, waiting for results. The program is like a series of you know, cultural venues and then a lot of uh, uh, restaurants and shops and public spaces. And the idea is that we had was to kind of look at the site as, as what it is, which is pretty much a, a divide in between two cities. Uh, the one is you know, the historical city, obviously, and then the other one is the beach city, which is literally a city uh, and that's what is kind of uh, exceptional about it. There's so many buildings that actually have addresses, they actually have numbers, you know, uh, for, and these buildings are, of course, not real buildings, they're shacks uh, where you can, you know, uh, either get a drink or change or uh, have uh, restrooms, different things. And then the issue is basically how do, how do we deal with the connection along the sea and across from that city to the other one? 
So uh, we have this situation that if you walk along the sea, uh, along the kind of waterfront, you don't see the sea, you don't have any relationship to it because of this other uh, one story city that kind of uh, stretches uh, along the, the waterfront. So we decided to do something that would actually allow from going you know, down and up, uh, uh, allow from uh, the idea of like sort of uh, relating visually to, uh, to the sea, but also kind of uh, physically to the city behind. And then we made like a bunch of studies for that, which we always do <coughs> in order to get to uh, some sort of idea of uh, you know, what, could, what could work, what could uh, uh, be an inspiration. In this case, it was very literal, uh, uh, the bullet marks, uh, you know, pattern of uh, Copacabana is extremely interesting because it's the perfect kind of uh, contraction of a long and a, a sort of uh, transversal axis. So we started exploring this uh, condition and <coughs> develop it almost sort of uh, uh, naturally over the whole uh, site in order to create these two uh, conditions. This is the program breakdown. And what's interesting is that the, the fabric of it is, is very similar, but as you splice it and work with it in a three-dimensional way, you start uh, playing with its uh, edges or like its, its kind of extremes to the point of having here on the edge uh, a sort of a hotel of nine stories that you, you know is like a real sort of mount. You can climb it if you, if you have the condition for. Uh, but it's, um, it's exactly the same sort of uh, fabric as the rest of the, um, the project. So within that footprint that's very even, there's a lot of conditions that can occur. And uh, these conditions are uh, happening in, in a three-dimensional uh, manner where you have you know, restaurants and like sort of parking spaces and different uh, shops that are all kind of inserted within the fabric. But at the same time, you have a kind of 100% uh, uh, space of uh, uh, public space. So this is, let's say, a ground floor, the first floor, and then if you look at it in the, in the kind of streetscape, it's all sort of uh, uh, accessible. <coughs> this is the hotel, um, which I think yeah, this is a plan of. So it's it, it is a nine-story building. It's pretty dense. It's actually a, a rather traditional uh, type of hotel in the sense that it has, you know, a corridor and like room facing the city and rooms facing the sea. Uh, but of course, it's in the section that it sort of becomes a, a sort of special place. And this leads to like a project that we did. Actually, it's probably the last project I've been working on um, for uh, Brazil. We were called up by. Um, a group uh, called EBX um, for uh, standing for IK Batista group uh, who's uh, you know Brazil's uh, richest man who wants to do uh, to develop a new convention center and, and sort of a, a shopping mall in the Gloria neighborhood of uh, Rio what's interesting about uh, that neighborhood in particular is that it's s overloaded with history and, and sort of very heavy uh, historical issues such as you know, uh, World War II uh, monument or uh, Museum of uh, Modern Art. Um, at the same time, it's loaded with infrastructural uh, uh, conditions, such as the, the airport. And this is exactly where you know the projects start to uh, make sense and to be interesting. Is where it meets you know a need and and a sort of a historical uh, setting. What we've been trying to do is to actually stretch, I mean, of course, the, the landscape around is extremely uh, interesting and, and almost something you cannot uh, compete against. So we're not, uh, we, we've tried not to uh, do too much architecture in that project. You have, you know, the Museum of uh, Modern Art, which is uh, uh, kind of very present and very uh, strong piece of architecture. Then you have Buller Marx uh, that comes all the way through the Flamengo Park um, and is omnipresent in that site. A big deal that I didn't, I wasn't aware of that you know in Brazil it's so hard to actually do anything uh, when you have historical settings because the whole country is kind of frozen into its sort of uh, historical uh, uh, beauties. Like, for instance, Bullemarx uh, being present is almost meaning that you cannot do any architecture. Uh, so one thing that we were very much aware of is that our site was, you know, the kind of center of focus of all these locations. At the same time, we cannot do too much. I mean, we had to sort of like 
be uh, uh, torn down. This is the marina requirements. We decided to create a new pier, which would become a pier that actually blocks the wave so that the marina can be fully used. And then within that pier, we would stretch the program. So what you have is basically a pretty uh, mundane, sort of not so interesting uh, set of uh, programmatic requirements. Uh, restaurant, shopping, convention center, and a, a big exhibition hall. So the idea was to like stretch that as much as we could over onto the site, create some patios to actually uh, uh, give in, you know, landscape qualities to a program that normally doesn't have any, which is, you know, the convention uh, hall and then start manipulating that cross into uh, 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 letting the whole neighborhood come in. The reason why we did all this, and of course benefiting from some views, was um, the reason we did this kind of very open plan, very landscape-like uh, project, was in order to, uh, to try to deal with a problem that there is locally, which is of course, you know, uh, uh, violence and, uh, and uh, sort of segregation so that what's happening currently on the side is that the whole side is fenced off and what we're advocating is total openness. What we believe is that this neighborhood needs to have a certain uh, uh, return of, you know, neighbors taking over their own uh, uh, spaces, which is currently not happening at all, so that the project would actually allow for, you know, a, a series of activities to occur and therefore a sort of more natural uh, uh, type of control on the site. There was also one big requirement was that the, the settings were supposed to be, or are supposed to be the, the 2016 Olympics uh, uh, departure for the sailing competition. So you have like a series of demands that needed to be uh, uh, dealt with. So in the end, the project is ending up as a kind of pretty simple uh, uh, loop of, uh, of uh, four strings around you know, this exhibition hall. Place like this, and very much. I mean, what's sad about yeah, this is better. Like here, you can see that it sort of links uh, uh, the whole park uh, connections from bullet marks, which actually surrounds the whole uh, um, bay. So uh, unfortunately, uh, this project we recently heard we lost. Uh, so it's not going to happen. At least not going to happen like that. Uh, some local guy get the get the job, but um, we're looking forward to see to see what they came up with. Which brings me to uh, uh, actually a series of uh, so performative architecture that I also will never perform. It's uh, three projects that I, um, that we've been uh, working on that are all lost projects, but I think are interesting because first I've never shown them the recent projects, and uh, except from one of them. And uh, secondly, I think it's also like, it's interesting to see that, you know, within the practice, we, uh, we try to achieve something that sometimes doesn't really get to where it should be, but it's, it's, a, it's an important aspect of the project. Uh, if you take this, this is a Beirut. Um, so it's a project for the performing arts uh, house um, in Beirut. And it's a site that's very special because it's located on one side you have, you know, a skyway or sort of a highway that divides really uh, two neighborhoods. One is the new BCD, Beirut Central District, uh, which is, you know, a, a very incredible kind of developing uh, ground. And the other one is this sort of like more sort of uh, historical neighborhood um, that's somewhat uh, left uh, as, as is. The site was, uh, of course, regulated very specifically. What we decided is to actually try to uh, take an abstract first take on the, on the project and do this kind of 40 by 40 cube, uh, full volume, uh, and try to see what we could do with it. There's a series of programs that are required. And of course, it's a it's pretty exciting uh, condition because it's all sort of uh, uh, performing and art uh, programs. Another thing that was, uh, or maybe a thing that was much more interesting about the whole uh, brief was that they outline a, a, a specificity of the um, of the Beirut uh, art scene was that they had a lot of um, street art uh, happening or street performances. So what we started looking at is ways to uh, put the program together in in uh, 
in a manner that would allow for some sort of a porosity or some elements of a, a porosity within the building. These kind of uh, various decks or various uh, terraces that would allow for uh, public performances to occur. So this is the sort of volume that we ended up with that allows for you know, an entrance uh, front and back that would be an open entrance that would allow for anything to happen and then a kind of terrace deck that also allows for, um, for uh, public performances. So you have the kind of conditions of view. And then the way you circulate through the building is actually outdoor. So you can get from one uh, to the other of these sort of open spaces uh, outdoor. And then you get into the, the real sort of official performance spaces that are in a way, symbolically, uh, uh, it's unfortunate that they, they end up being on the top because, uh, of course, it's what we want to uh, show is that the main thing is the sort of voice, uh, but that's, um, there's also some practical issues. So this is, you know, the way the place should be. And if you look at it, I mean, it's a building that's mostly uh, experienced in section. Um, you have these sort of the big halls and the exhibition spaces and the theater here, the cinema, but then mostly is these sort of uh, voids that are uh, orchestrating or organizing um, the actual solids. So that's the view from the back where you have you know, a stage uh, that's open there. This is the top uh, stage or the top terrace. That's the kind of lobby where you know the interior the sort of uh, the arrival space gets sucked into the, the interior of the place. This is just the performance hall. And the plan, very simple, uh, in a way very basic. I'm just not going to go through in detail. But in the section again, I mean, you get to see the, the idea of the, the project where you have, you know, entrance hall, back entrance hall with happenings and, and this sort of terrace. And the rest is, is sort of a library here, offices, um, exhibition space, and uh, auditoriums. Moving on from there to a, a project in, uh, in Taipei uh, that we did as a sort of a, a open competition, which is really tough because I uh, can't remember. I mean, I think in the Beirut one, there's like, there was like 600 and more uh, submittals. In this one, I, I don't know how many, but there was also quite a few. What was interesting for us was that uh, the project was actually uh, suggesting that there would be, it's a pop music center. So, <laughs> I mean, I don't know actually much about pop music, uh, but the, the kind of uh, condition that interested me the most was this uh, divide in between having an open air scene uh, or stage and a, an indoor uh, stage, and how we could sort of uh, uh, place that into a site that was pretty complex, you know, one half was on a, uh, one side of a busy road, the other one on the other side, and it was sort of a, a, a challenge to uh, deal with that. So what we did is actually trying to uh, make an urban form or like an urban project that would deal with these conditions and then take advantage of it in order to create a sort of a, a, an unexpected uh, a condition of two stages facing each other across a void. So that void would be the place where anything could happen. And anything could be from you know a sports event to art event to uh, big gatherings. And so we basically resolved all the other program, like all the offices and all the kind of facilities that were required in order to get that that sort of a, a, a project to run. We used those in order to fill you know the connections or like the sort of a, across the street connections that were uh, required for the project. So you have this. Um, uh, urban scape, let's say, and then this sort of a uh, public space uh, condition of uh, a void, uh, sort of two stages facing each other uh, across a void, overviewing the city and uh, connecting onto the parks. And then we had to design also the full site in terms of parks. So we decided to, of course, work with this a similar kind of um, uh, typology of, uh, of spaces going through quickly. So, well, this is very burned. But basically, these are like all the sort of boring spaces, you know, the 
the basic, uh, the offices and the different uh, uh, spaces that are supposed to uh, create the connections with the public space on top. This is the void across and the final um, project. So that's a project that we, uh, as I said, lost as well. I mean, we got a mention or something. Uh, it doesn't get us very far. Um, but, um, but it allowed us to, uh, to think about, you know, this issue of sort of urbanity uh, or like urban uh, uh, conditions and public space again. This is a project that we did earlier and I'm just showing it because of its insanity in a way. Uh, it's, it's a private Danish developer who came to us uh, and asked us to uh, design six million square meters, uh, which is a, a kind of completely incomprehensible uh, set of uh, uh, or conditional scale, um, and he also said that it had to be uh, 666 meters high, uh, which was also sort of weird. And after a while, he, he came to and said it was 888 meters. And uh, apparently, he had like a lot of uh, uh, discussions, you know, in the background, uh, because at the end he said like it had to be like 1,111 meters high. And um, and on top of all that, it had to be feng shui. Um, so you're starting to get the sort of idea of the, the setting. Uh, we're in uh, Shenzhen, next to Hong Kong, and it was at this time when, you know, Shenzhen is sort of booming and developing as a sort of uh, extension of Hong Kong. Uh, when we went to the site and started analyzing it, we realized that the condition was actually uh, uh, across, you know, the past 20, 30 years, like really uh, depressing. There was like no more uh, nature happening in the, in the region. We went from this uh, condition of urbanity to this one in 20 years. Um, and this, this was actually happening uh, against, you know, topography and everything. I mean, like, sort of uh, uh, flattening the land. Um, this is Hong Kong, so, like, as a condition, it's a very interesting condition because you have, you know, almost like a three-dimensional urbanism with nature. And this was uh, the, the sort of uh, version of it in uh, Shenzhen. So what we started as a kind of question was, could we do a project that's, you know, a new Hong Kong or sort of an extension of Hong Kong? Uh, this was our site. And what we started looking at, I mean, after a lot of uh, tryouts and a lot of failures, uh, trying to do, you know, an interesting tower of 1,111 meters, whatever, and like not really getting anywhere, we just realized that we were asking ourselves the wrong question is that it wasn't about doing a tower, it was actually doing a, a city. That was the real question. Um, so we started looking at this, this condition of uh, uh, overlaying neighborhoods onto each other and, and sort of understanding you know, what sort of components of a neighborhood we could uh, uh, provide in order to, uh, to create that sort of vertical urbanism. And so we came up with this very simple uh, paper uh, model that was actually the, the sort of startup for the, the whole project. Um, if you look at the project in a sort of, like in plan, uh, and without the program, but just look at the void, the main void, it's, it's quite funny that it actually looks like a Mise van der Rohe column. Uh, but in fact, the project is this kind of wrong uh, uh, set of uh, programs where you have on the inside all the commercial and all the office spaces, on the outside all the um, uh, residential spaces, and then parks sort of tying these two together. So if you look at it in section, when it gets deeper, and darker is uh, public programs such as, you know, cinemas and sports fields. And then when you zoom in, you have, you know, terraces towards the inside and then uh, um, uh, commercial spaces on the outside. And of course this was, you know, a study, let's say. It's, uh, it was developed to a certain level, but not, not fully. And uh, it was also kind of stopped at the moment of uh, you know, a crisis when uh, developers started uh, running away from these kind of uh, developments. But it was interesting as a, as a sort of way of thinking, uh, you know, <laughs> even like contextual issues. I mean, you know that in, the, in, the, in this sort of uh, neighborhood of Shenzhen, you know, everything will go in like no time. So it's, it's also like a way to, uh, to deal with, uh, with that question, maybe a pretty radical way, but, um, and so we presented that project to the Shenzhen uh, Biennale back then, 2009, 
2008, and, uh, and two hours before presenting, actually opening the Biennale, the, this model here uh, disappeared. So it was like, you know, presented on the, in our space, and somebody came around and picked the, the tower, just the tower, I mean, the, the, the base was, was left. It's just like, uh, because it's, it's made of foam, so out of foam, so it's uh, one kilo or 1.5 kilo, it's, it's nothing. Somebody just like left with it. Uh, and so I was joking uh, to uh, King Jun Ma, the, the curator, that you know, that project would start you know, replicating like a hell in, a, in the region in the future, which of course didn't happen, but it's sort of, I mean, he was actually really sort of pissed off about the whole uh, story because, I don't know, of this kind of Chinese guilt. Uh, I don't know what it was. Uh, I, I, I thought it was really funny. And we also like we get he made a he redid the whole model for us and then sent it to us. But he did it in perspex, so it was like a hundred kilos now. So we can't. I mean, basically, it sits in our office. We can't move it anywhere. I mean, it's just impossible. And what brings me to a, um, a last project, which is a project uh, uh, that I'm sort of completing now for a ski jump in, in uh, Oslo. And I'm going to show it in a sort of different way that I do normally. It's slightly more in depth to, uh, to give it uh, like the whole history behind. Um, it's what interest me, interested me in the first place to do the competition, it's again an open competition. This time we succeeded, so it's a little more happy ending. Uh, what interested me was this sort of history of the place that it's sort of uh, uh, for like a hundred years has been the place where you know ski jumping as a, as a discipline has evolved. Um, and you can see uh, different iterations of the ski jump you can see, for instance, in this like super weird setting of a of a lake, a natural lake in the bottom during the summertime, um, like a sort of pretty picture of this sort of weird animal that landed into this like natural setting, um, and then in '82 uh, they made this uh, version of it. So it it evolved like 18 times until now. Um, and this iteration was the one we had to deal with. It's a sort of uh, the ski jump as, uh, as, as we were uh, given uh, to deal with. It was a place where, you know, back in 52 when the Olympics uh, were on, they had 120,000 people over there, which is the record so far of uh, attendance. And so we looked at this whole history and started uh, uh, reflecting on it. Um, so we did the competition and, and won the competition. Uh, everything sounded perfect, uh, and then there's uh, happened some post-competition drama. Uh, and it, there's been a lot more than what I'm going to show, but you know, there's been a few moments. Uh, first thing was that you know somebody proposed that, and this is like, of course, in, in a Scandinavian context, everybody can say whatever they want, and of course they get heard, you know, in the main press. Uh, uh, should the place uh, be changed? Like, should Holmacombe be moved to another location? And there was like quite a bit of a, a discussion regarding that issue because you could save money, you could like do all sorts of things. Uh, should, you know, Holmacombe be covered? I mean, be an indoor space? That was also uh, going on for a while. Uh, of course, you know, it was killed because it was way too over budget. One of the problems of Holmacombe as a location is that it's, it's very windy. So there's a lot of, it's a very dangerous place. I mean, it's a bit like, you know, US Open these days, <laughs> it's kind of impossible to, to get a game going. But uh, like uh, in, in Oslo, it's a little more dangerous because you know they do jump and sometimes wind does blow and then accidents uh, could happen. So um, another thing was that then they decided not to build the ski jump, even though it had been sort of uh, uh, decided and you know the competition was won. Uh, and I think that's, that comes out of this kind of political uh, uh, sort of attitude to be scared of too much public opinions. Then at some point some guy came up and said that uh, warned the uh, international architects com uh, community not to uh, submit projects in, uh, in Norway and in Oslo in particular because uh, you know, they would not be realized. And it's true that Oslo has a pretty long string of, uh, of international competition not being realized. Uh, some of which OMA has participated in. Um, 
So then, after all, uh, in December, they actually decided to rehabilitate the ski jump. So, meaning like they would do it, but they didn't really, really say how. Uh, what it turned out to be is that they wanted to make a renovation of the ski jump. And then we had to, which I'll explain, to study uh, what that meant. Then the person that was responsible for all that got kicked out because uh, she kind of hid, uh, she was hiding some uh, uh, budget problems that were occurring with the, <laughs> with the competition uh, and the reality of the budget. Uh, this project started in 2005 with, as a kind of political decision to be a 50 million uh, Norwegian corner project. When in 2007 we took on the competition, it was a 500 million corner uh, budget and we ended up building it for 800 million. So you could see that there's like a pretty sort of uh, extensive uh, gap uh, of knowledge in terms of like budget calculation. Uh, and she was uh, partially re responsible of that. So um, in this mess, we started a, a petition because we could see that things were like so sketchy that we had to uh, intervene. So we actually made a, com a petition on the online where you could support uh, you know, our project. And it, it recorded like uh, 2,000 uh, uh, votes, which I think was enough to you know, start a certain uh, dis discussion among the municipality. Then came up this issue uh, that, you know, <laughs> <laughs> that we were not exactly uh, professionals in ski jumping. And, uh, and there is, that's so true because if you know anything about Denmark and Belgium, it's like the two most flat countries in the world together with the Netherlands. Uh, so if you look at the history of, of Norway with you know, all these like, and, and this was also learning for me, you know, uh, all these great names, uh, historical uh, and, and, and contemporary great uh, ski jumpers. And then you take Denmark and it's got like, you know, basically one skier that's okay. And it's a... <laughs> It's an alpine skier and, and like Belgium has known. Uh, so uh, uh, the question was like this sort of, you know, uh, looking at the Zaha's uh, achievements and, and sort of, uh, you know, the pretty uh, important achievement when uh, it comes to ski jumping and just kind of wondering, you know, what has actually uh, uh, sort of allowed that condition. <laughs> and, uh, and just completely, like taking it as a joke, but like, also, like, sort of, as a way to sort of uh, get back to uh, the issue of, you know, uh, the, the criticism that we were uh, we were under this attack of, you know, whether we would be able to do it or not. So the first thing was, you know, being Norwegian and whatever that meant, you know, wearing some crazy hats, or, uh, but basically it meant like being like having a local office, which is what we did. So we opened up uh, uh, an office in Oslo, and then sort of discussing this issue of of uh, uh, the icon of, um, of, of a country, of a nation, and sort of looking at what that could mean in terms of a, in terms of a project. And in fact, at that point, trying to re-explain you know, what our project was about. So we just sort of went in and, and explained you know, the basics of our project over and over in order to kind of gain back this sort of uh, uh, um, I don't know, agreement that we already get officially from the competition but in this case uh, from the citizens. And the basic idea was to say, okay, there's an ideal slope and this is something that we have as a given and there's issues of wind protection. So we making, you know, the wind protection condition. Then we sort of extending that and, and by offsetting that, considering, you know, maybe a simplification of the shape. By doing so, we also decide to move all the, all the land program, the program that's supposed to support the, the project into the hill so that it becomes this sort of a, a slightly more uh, simple shape that then is being reconnected by a, an elevator uh, so that all programs are along one string. Um, then the kind of cherry on top was to say, instead of uh, making a project that is an icon only, it's actually a project that allows for rethinking you know, the idea of the icon and actually stating that the icon is, in fact, Oslo, because what's interesting about this location is that it's the best place to view Oslo. So this is the Oslo Fjord, and this is how you could sort of imagine, you know, uh, experiencing that place uh, outside, you know, whether it rains or snows or whatever, you could actually see uh, the city in, uh, in the most kind of amazing condition. Um, so these are views from the competition. And then later on, we worked 
on the project, developing you know the different uh, sort of like little aspects of it, and I'll go through some of them. This is the project that we uh, ended up getting an agreement on. Um, you see, it's pretty faithful to the original project, but I'll go to some uh, aspects of that that are sometimes uh, great, sometimes really painful. Um, we were first required to uh, study a rehabilitation, which meant that we had actually to renovate potentially the structure. So instead of uh, doing a whole new jump, we also were asked to study this. And, and by study, I mean like go all the way through. Uh, and this is like basically wrapping the existing ski jump with a, a steel structure just in order to extend it for a few uh, meters, which was totally absurd. Um, and this was the other study that we had to make, which is our, uh, our jump from the competition. Um, <coughs> finally, in uh, April, we are uh, given you know, uh, the news that we're gonna be hired for the job that we already uh, won you know, months before. Um, but then they still don't know what to do and they don't know what level of a ski jump they're going to be doing because there's all these different sort of uh, 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 steps in ski jumping, you know, from the, the K18, the K15, 115 was like the existing one. So we still don't know. In the end, uh, they kind of settled for the K120 and then we start studying it. There's a lot of like sort of very demanding little aspects that I'm not going to go through. But in the end, we end up agreeing on this setup and this way of sort of splitting the project in different sub uh, condition, different uh, uh, sub projects that we had to uh, uh, deal with with different uh, levels of uh, um, uh, importance. So you have, of course, the in run, like the actual jump and the landing. It's a very important asp aspect of the project because the landing is in fact really expensive to make considering that you have to dig into the, the, the rocks uh, of, the of, the, of the landscape. Then little things such as this uh, uh, commentator and, and judges boxes, very demanding as well because every judge has to see the jump from the very top to the very end. Then the arena, the media boxes where basically all the TV uh, and uh, the journalists are and then all these different conditions. If you look on the other side, one that I will sort of point at is this uh, uh, weird combo of the King's Lounge, so it's like where the royal family uh, hangs out, and then the shop. <laughs> sort of a, a beautiful uh, package. And so if you take that, that location, that's the, the kind of royal family lounge with their you know, guest of honor. And so it of course has to be <laughs> It's sort of a grand spot, but at the same time, you know, when we went through the first revision of the, the project after they kind of build it, you know, according to drawings, but totally not according to details, uh, we were like appalled by, you know, the level of interest that the Norwegians have to, uh, towards their royal family. It, was, uh, it looked like a, I don't know, like a shanty town of some sort. So, uh, so this is changing now. Uh, the structure of the jump is, of course, the main thing, and, and the way it's built, it's, it's a steel structure. It's, in fact, I wouldn't say that interesting. I mean, not, not that sort of advanced. You know, it's uh, a lot of steel. I mean, a thousand tons of steel. Uh, it's built in eight pieces, so it's, it's sort of uh, uh, being built, you know, in chunks. And we uh, had to set up a sort of a workshop or like a, a kind of uh, uh, assembly shop at the back of the drum in order to, uh, to, do, uh, to make this possible. So all the, all the portions, uh, the sections that you see were assembled fully as you see them here in this uh, location and in order to compose the full uh, structure. One thing that was though uh, quite a, a battle to, to get through is the fact that we had to study you know, the deformations in the wind of the jump. Uh, not so much because we were fearing that it was gonna break but in fact, because it's, it's a matter of comfort and, and of just simple you know, use of, the, of the, the hill as a jump. So, um, so we consider at some point making, putting a, a huge weight uh, uh, on the top in order to kind of stabilize the thing. And we have the possibility to still do so if it's necessary, but we need to kind of experiment uh, the, the jump a little bit before. Uh, so this is uh, in tune with the facade. The facade is, is you know, something that 
needs to kind of uh, uh, act as a buffer towards uh, the winds because, of course, it takes a lot of winds. Um, so the point is that it has to be perforated and up to 50% uh, over here and in between 35 and 50% for the jump itself. So we went through a series of uh, different options, like for instance, this, this is what we did uh, at the mountain, a kind of perforated steel plate, or this one, which was really exciting as a cha chain mail, uh, but also extremely expensive. And in fact, in order to make it at all, we had to like press the, the button of, you know, like star production immediately uh, as we had won the competition in order for it to be even produced uh, on time. Uh, because all these rings are just being welded, you know, together uh, uh, one by one. So it's, uh, it's totally insane as a production, but it looks beautiful. Then we looked at the uh, sort of stretch metal, like the new museum facade, which doesn't, like surprisingly doesn't work for, uh, for wind uh, buffer because it's, there's too much imprecisions uh, uh, and, and sort of mistakes into the the splicing of the steel that actually makes, creates more turbulences or divert more wind than you would want to um, out of it. So in the end, we, uh, we uh, got this one that was the best result in the wind tunnels. Uh, it's a very straightforward uh, sort of a mesh that stretches uh, um, one way and allows for one thing that is extremely practical and became like the concept of the whole passage, which is that you can just stretch it from one side all the way through down and then hook it back up one piece. And that became interesting in the idea of actually creating this sort of a, a feeling of, you know, this kind of stretch uh, a piece that you bend. So that if you kind of zoom on it, it's actually like literally being bent uh, uh, as a sort of a, uh, yeah, almost as, as, a, as a fabric. And this is just pictures during construction. It's pretty tough to uh, build in Norway. It uh, gets really, uh, pretty, really cold and snowy. So this is the in the making. So finally, in uh, October, we started construction, and this is just as a kind of uh, as a kind of symbol. You know, we had we decapitated the existing ski job, so I took the the head off, um, and it's it's actually still lying on site next door. Uh, I don't know what they're gonna do with it. But <laughs> I think it's just gonna stand there and rot. Um, so this was the first, uh, uh, in a way, the first condition of, uh, of construction and the first failure is that you can see that this existing uh, building ar around which we're building is is a uh, is a sort of a remain of the old ju uh, jump, uh, and it's something that I'm still trying to get rid of, but uh, I don't think I'm managing. Um, it's uh, what's what we call the Kulbug. Uh, it's an existing uh, administration building that is somehow uh, uh, being the excuse to call this a renovation and not a new build uh, on a political level. So there's this big question of whether we have the Kulbug or we actually deal with it and, and try to uh, uh, take it away or, or slice it so that there is a, a visual connection between the two sides of the ski jump, which is has been the intention for the from the competition all along. So um, basically, the idea is that you have the lobby entrance here, and then you could go down, you know, into the arena from this staircase, this existing building, and uh, and sort of have this sort of interaction of the different programs. But currently, it's it's looking like this, and not like this as we're trying to get it. Okay, it's really hard to see anything there. So this is the underside of the of the jump, and this is when we started, like you know, feeling how the jump would be, and the sort of various uh, steps of building the structure. I'm just trying to go through. This was like a midterm office visit uh, where we brought the whole office to see the jump. Like I said, it's it's a really tough place to build. Like uh, it's foggy almost like half of the time. And then on the on November 24, we uh, raised up the the last piece, the eighth section of the jump, which is a pretty dramatic uh, experience, especially when it got closer and closer. And these dudes were just 
smoking cigarettes and like holding, you know, the thing and like, ah, so, like, like, <laughs> it really, uh, I mean, that's when you know you're working in a sort of a Viking uh, land. <laughs> so it took, it took a while to get it in place because of the wind. Um, and that last piece was heavier than most of the other ones. Um, you can see that the, uh, the connection was made. And then we kept the, the crane uh, holding it for quite a while while um, and it was being like released sort of gradually to test <laughs> that, uh, you know, the cantilever was working. Uh, I, I love this sort of uh, moment of lack of trust in, uh, in whatever, you know, engineering has been, uh, has been sort of deployed. And so at some point, <laughs> Some guy started uh, coming into the hill. Like, uh, of course, it was far from being uh, ready, but you know, it's too tempting. So locally, it's such a big, you know, like people, like there's an entire neighborhood of people living just next to the ski jump, and they're all like total fanatic skiers. So of course, at some point, you know, some kid get drunk, and they're like, okay, let's let's do it now. And so that was the first uh, the first moment. Then the construction went on until uh, it was sort of getting close to completion. This is when we started doing, so basically like all this inside stuff is, you know, just uh, um, our backbone for placing all the installations because there's a lot of insulation going into the, the structure. And then the project was more or less, say, done uh, in its basic form. I mean, you can see that it's still not done over here, but it's more or less done. Uh, with the facade, and then uh, some guys came over and base jumped it, and uh, <laughs> it was like this sort of uh, I've re only really bad pictures, but it was pretty intense because of course they had first they had to burst into the place, and then they had to like climb up the whole thing, uh, sort of. I don't think there was even like a stair at the time, uh, so they just had to get up, and uh, then they base jumped. It's just kind of intense. And then another uh, little issue that, <laughs> that happened is that politically there was a, a, a vote to, um, to have a, a skier called Anate Sagan, uh, a woman skier, to be the first jumper to jump the hill. Uh, and that was the sort of like, you know, first time a, a woman would actually uh, um, inaugurate, you know, uh, Olympic uh, ski jump. And then this idiot here, <laughs> It's uh, Bjorn Ramon is like the, the ultimate uh, sort of star of ski jumping in, uh, in Norway. He uh, organized together with his friends from the ski association to like coop the whole uh, political decision. And the night before, just jumped, you know, illegally uh, on the hill to, uh, <laughs> so, uh, and uh, apparently later on he started crying about it uh, on TV and was really sorry. But you know, she, she was supposed to be the one to sort of uh, uh, do the first jump, which is too bad that she didn't. So these are the pictures of what happened right after, which is the, the basically the test championship. We had a soft opening to uh, test the place, uh, and that's not in order to uh, uh, do a reopening, but it was more because there's a lot of uh, um, logistics to be dealt with on site that we had to, uh, uh, to try out, you know, a lot of, uh, uh, journalists are coming in, like 2,000 journalists need to report from the World Championship. Uh, so we had to test it uh, one time first. So this was one of the first jumps during the championship. And just some views of the place as it is today. So we have, we're almost, you know, finishing the place now. These are views we took uh, during the championship. I love this one where the whole city is kind of gone in the clouds. And we also did, a, a, you know, in order to uh, be able to wear, we did a, an iPhone app with some, uh, with some guys uh, in, uh, in Norway, which unfortunately we didn't manage to, uh, to get a sort of a percentage on, so they're just like selling like maniacs and we're not getting anything. Um, and then I'm just gonna end with this image of the, the jump being this, uh, um, uh, what, what I was told once is that it looked like this fantastic long chair for God. And then, uh, <laughs> then I sort of tried to find a, you know, to Google that and find something, but I couldn't. So I found this one, which I thought was pretty, uh, <laughs> pretty well uh, placed. 
So, thank you. I'm just cold, eh? it's not because I want to leave. <laughs> Any questions? Well, I mean, I think we're, we're always trying to uh, to do the, the full package. Uh, I mean, it's not a, there's a lot of aspects to it, but the main one is, of course, that it's the only way we have to, uh, to actually explore, you know, architecture. It's because when, like, the competition level is like maybe 10% uh, of what you can explore. And, uh, and things such as, I mean, even though the, the building looks pretty faithful to you know, the competition uh, uh, moment, it's still, uh, there's still like a million things that happen afterwards that were like you know, uh, uh, improvements and sort of uh, new, uh, new ideas that came. Uh, and, and this is what makes you know, the, the profession really uh, exciting, obviously. But um, in, in countries that are you know, much further away, like so doing some work in Mexico or like in Asia, it's harder to first to convince yourself to do it uh, and then you know, to convince your client to, uh, to, to go for it. Or you have to, again, you know, open. I think if we had really thought for it, we could have avoided to set up you know, a local office for the ski jump because we were only an hour away. I think it's a lot harder when you like, you know, having to travel 12 hours and so, so I think we, we would probably be more keen on either opening offices or sort of working with someone locally if it was like a further away project. But I haven't really, I've done collaborations with offices in, in China where they've been doing the detailing and we've been redlining it. And we're still waiting for the, the kind of drawing to red line. You know, it's it like it's really sort of a, something to to remember. Uh, in the end, it's much more. I mean, depending on the project, some projects are s sort of sufficiently standard that, that you can do it. Uh, interestingly enough, I just o launched uh, or like so open a building in uh, in Norway as well in Stavanger for a, a hotel which. Uh, did you go or did you not go? You didn't go see it. Yeah, but you were around, right? And uh, I'm actually kind of happy you didn't go see it because there, you know, we didn't do the full package. We didn't draw the, the, the details of it. Uh, we had a local office do it. And, uh, you know, like I'm not sure that, uh, you know, I would want you to see it actually. 
I mean, there's a lot of aspects where we didn't have to, we didn't get the chance to battle. I mean, we didn't get simply the occasion, the, like the kind of capacity to, to be involved in decisions. And I think that's, that's a big learning actually. It's something that uh, we need to avoid. Uh, or we need to be better at sort of setting up those collaboration in a really intelligent way that we know who we deal with and we know what are our rights. Hello, uh, my name is Abdel. Uh, I just want to thank you very much for your presentation. There were some very interesting ideas in there. Um, the thing that I kind of jumped out at me from it was looking at your, some of the projects that you presented, and maybe it's not something the office in general, but there's a certain scale about your project. Um, I mean, the ski jump has a bit of a scale on its own that you can't really play around with too much. But I was looking at the other one, namely the China one, with the tower and uh, the two theater project where mm. it seemed to be pretty massive compared to its context and um, almost uh, out of scale compared to what it is where it's located. Mm. Um, I'm wondering if that ever came up in conversation or like public or against it saying that it's too big or if that ever comes in conversation during the, the design process mm. where the scale becomes an issue where it's maybe too big or kind of out of place in that sense. Mm. And if you can comment on that. Uh, I mean, I think the Chinese one is, is definitely too big. Um, but you know, that was part of the, the requirement. Um, I don't think, you know, the two other ones I think are pretty, uh, I mean, they're basically smaller than the neighbors. So I don't think they're kind of fitting the too big category. Uh, but I think just, Maybe generally, you know, the issue of, uh, I mean, I'm fighting a, a building permit right now in Brussels uh, for the exact same reason that I'm being told that the building is too big. It's like two stories above, you know, the neighbors, but whatever. And uh, I mean, I think in New York, uh, I should show you this amazing picture I found, like uh, I just took uh, yesterday next to my hotel, there's this building that's, it's like this kind of row housing kind of thing on 8th Avenue. And there's, you know, three story buildings, and then there's one insert, like kind of an infill, and it's 40 stories. I mean, I'm the, I mean, there's a lot of insane ones in New York, but that one is like really beyond, it's 40 stories tall. And uh, I don't, I mean, I think the, like contextual issues are to be dealt with in different terms than, you know, whether it's too big or too small. I mean, if you take the Shenzhen project, is too big for where it is now, but by the time it's done, the now is gone, and the whole neighborhood has changed completely. And this is, I mean, if you go to Shenzhen today, it's the case. I mean, the, all these neighborhoods have transformed completely from this sort of factory landscape to, you know, like uh, much more upgraded type of programs. So, yeah, I mean, it's, I mean, too big or too small, I mean, I, I don't know, it's a, Something to take uh, to take with uh, a little more criticism, I think. Um, of course, you know, a thousand meter tall building is maybe too big anywhere. You know, like, or is it? I mean, it's just really uh, <laughs> maybe. <laughs> I don't know. I don't, I don't think the other buildings are too big in any, anyway. Like, um, they're just. Feels like they fit right in. <laughs> so you don't take too big as a compliment. As a compliment? Yeah. No, I mean, uh, <laughs> I don't care. You know. <laughs> I don't. Could be right. You could say. I mean, one answer would be that, mm. that you have to build out of scale, either bigger or smaller. Otherwise, mm. you're actually not building. Mm. I mean, you're just disappearing in. Yeah. So you could say. You could be happy that. This yeah. Yeah, but I, I mean, I'm happy that it stands out, but not necessarily because it's too big. I mean, I'm happy that it sort of deals with context, contextual issues in a way that is not maybe about whether it's too big or too small or whether it got, you know, the right ornament as the neighbors does, but maybe because it sort of activates its location in a kind of way that, that makes it stand out or makes it 
relate, you know, uh, differently. I was wondering how you keep your creative process so radical on a consistent basis. How do you be radical consistently? Because all of your buildings have a different look. and mm. So how do you avoid falling into a comfort zone or something that, a pattern that you repeat over and over, but mm. come up with something different every time? I think I'm too young to have that problem. Sorry? <laughs> I'm too young to have that problem of whether, you know, it's a, I don't know. Like, uh, I mean, one thing is that, you know, the, the, the process of doing a project is, is very open in the office and it's not at all, we don't have this kind of uh, sort of insane systematic, like we have some system in case we're in desperation mode and then we have like more like a sort of open expira exploration, sometimes even, you know, intuition-based sort of uh, exploration that allows for, uh, for instance, for anyone in the office to come up with an idea, uh, which allows for, you know, diversity or sort of, you know, uh, different sort of results. I think maybe my job is sort of to uh, uh, explore this sort of thread, the common thread within the project, so to try to kind of find out what is what could be, you know, a dialogue in between the different typologies of buildings we're doing, um, or the different scales of buildings, or non-buildings, you know, uh, which is part of the things that I was trying to kind of explain today. But, uh, but I'm definitely not interested in sort of, you know, issues of aesthetics or like that things should be one style or another style. It's not so much what we're dealing with or discussing in the office. Uh, by the way, uh, Rand Paul has been serving, right? Um, he, he's coming on the 24th, Friday the 24th. Do you have a last word about that? I mean, you're one of the, <laughs> you're one of the victims or victimizers of RMA. Yeah. Um, one thing that impresses me a lot about the RMA studio is that the, 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 I think there's a disproportionately large number of people who were there and have done really well afterwards. Mm -hmm. Somehow yeah. it has uh, clarified things for them rather yeah. than uh, destroyed them. Do you have any kind of view about that? Like, are you a survivor or were you energized by that? Of course. I mean, uh, clearly. Uh, yeah, you, were. you know, it's like I think the, but I think it's even for people that haven't been there and, and are sort of, you know, finding a sort of it's not really a method, but it's like a, a, a way of exploring, like the, this, this kind of idea of you know abundance and, and sort of right. insane uh, amount of uh, of tryouts, which right. is definitely a a way to uh, to open up your eyes. You know? But then it's a matter of afterwards of deciding also, okay. and and I think we're definitely deciding differently than you know uh, uh, Rem has maybe uh, showed us in the past, but we also uh, totally sort of, you know, needed that moment of, of opening our eyes. Uh, just like, you know, students do. I mean, I was there as a student, actually, to start with. Um, and it's a kind of a school. Yeah, and, and the fact that it was, I mean, you, you've given a lot of responsibilities, actually. I mean, at least back then, I don't know how the office works today. I mean, there was only one office back then, so. Um, but that, that was really interesting that you would have a lot on your shoulders. Um, anyway, thanks so. for coming. Thank you.